Now, the Bible teaches that from the moment of our birth, our days are brief and filled with trouble. Job 14.1. Now, again, this reality stems from the consequences of the fall in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate from the forbidden fruit, consequences fell upon humanity. This truth in Job 14, 1, that from the day of our birth, our days are brief, filled with trouble, is true for everyone. For everyone. As a result, each of us grapples with lives characterized by problems and turmoil, leaving us burdened with worry, anxiousness at every turn. Now, throughout our lives, we all experience countless of worries, and some more pressing than others. And so I am certain that tonight, many of you came to church with many pressing concerns and issues. And maybe some of you can't wait to just, Pastor Melo, finish the sermon so I can go home and take care of my personal needs, personal problems. Maybe some of you think, Pastor Melo, speed it up a little bit. Quick, get to your point so I can go home and take care of my needs. My personal problems. Now, there, there may be financial problems. It may be a job security, a financial obligation, or a health-related problem, such as the sea, a disease or, or access to health care. It may be a relationship problem, a marital problem, a parenting challenge that you have at home. It may be a family dynamic in conflict, or it may be an existential problem. The uncertainty of the future, the purpose and meaning of life, or even mortality and death. These might be your concerns tonight. This might be the things that you are worried about right now. But know this, that regardless of what this may be, know that your worries are a continuous theme throughout eternity. It has always been like that since the day that Adam and Eve sinned. For worries have been a constant companion for mankind. The burden of worry has plagued individuals and societies alike. However, as Christians, we are called to rise above these worries and find comfort and guidance in our God. Yes, brothers and sisters. As you will see in our text, the Apostle Paul commanded the church at Philippi not to be anxious, not to be worried about anything. About anything. This is a command. But you say, well, that's impossible. Yes. It is an impossibility that Paul is calling the church at Philippi to commit to, to do. He's commanding them to do not worry. But what about the problems of everyday life? What about that? What do we do with that? Well, this is what this message is about. This is what this sermon is about. It's about how we answer this question. How God has called us as Christians to cope with our worries. To cope with impossibilities. In a fallen world. Yes. The circumstances won't change. You fix one problem and it comes a second one. 
And that is the destiny of humanity. And it has been like that from the fall. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so as I preach from this text, let us listen to this whisper of hope that is in our text. Let us act upon it. By entrusting our anxieties to God through prayer. And by patiently waiting for his answer. This is what God has called us to do. This is what Paul is calling the church at Philippi to do. To entrust in the Lord. To put everything into his care. Into his hand. So let us hear this message. If you struggle with anxiety, if you struggle with worries, if there's a worry right now in your mind and your heart, listen to this sermon. This sermon is exactly for you. And I think that's for everyone because everyone struggles with worries, anxiety, which has plagued our society. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So point one, first, let us not worry about anything. Let us not worry about anything. Now, Paul begins our text by giving a charge, a command to the Philippians. And we know that because in the Greek, this charge is an imperative mood, which makes it a strong command. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, I want to begin by saying that if anyone had good reason to be anxious, it was Paul. Why? Because we know that Paul was suffering from severe persecution. Persecution from those who hated him, from the Judaizers, and from those who had left the faith, the enemies of the cross of Christ. And to top it all off, he was under house arrest, awaiting trial and his possible execution. Yet, despite all these things, we have, what we have seen from him in this letter has been an attitude of rejoicing. I mean, 13 times he speaks about rejoicing. The man is about to be executed. He's in a house, in a house prison in Rome. And yet 30 times he tells the church at Philippi to rejoice in the Lord. He's not bitter or, or angry about anything that has happened to him. He's calling out the church at Philippi to rejoice. In fact, he's even happy and rejoicing that the gospel is being preached even by his own enemies. And now he's telling the church at Philippi who are undergoing the same persecutions that he is. He's commanding them to rejoice with him. And commanding them to be gentle to everyone. And now he's commanding them not to be anxious after everything that they have been through. But he's telling them, hey, don't be anxious about anything that you're worried about. Like... Really? I mean, look what everything I'm going through, Paul. Yeah, but look at me as well. I'm in a house prison. I might be executed. I might be killed. But rejoice. Be gentle. And now, do not be anxious. Now, why is that? Could it be that Paul has found the secret to overcoming problems, concern, and anxiety? I strongly believe so. Do not be anxious about anything, declares Paul. Now, what does it mean, do not be anxious? Well, first, as I already mentioned, this is a strong command, not to be anxious. But now let us look at what the word anxiousness means here. So the word anxiousness, or in the King James, be careful, 
comes from a Greek word, merimnao. And this word means to be pulled in different directions. To be pulled in different directions. For example, let's say that you are looking at your life right now and you are hopeful. You see yourself having a bright future ahead of you. And so this hope pulls you in one direction. But then let's say that this week you go to the doctor and let's say you hear bad news by your doctor that you've been diagnosed with a very serious disease that puts a pause on your career or puts a pause on your wedding or puts a pause on your investment and their fear kicks in. And so now this fear pulls you in the opposite direction of hope. And so what happens? Well, you are pulled apart. This is what it means to be anxious, to be pulled apart in different directions. And this is what Paul is talking about. Do not be anxious. Do not be pulled apart in different directions. Now that's very enlightening. Especially when we talk about having more unity in the church. Because if the sheep can be pulled apart in different directions, when they are anxious, when they are dealing with a lot of problems, then that's a recipe for having this unity in the church. Because that means that their hearts and minds won't be in matters of the kingdom of God, but it will be in matters of their own selves, things that they're dealing with. But Paul is very precise in his command. Do not be anxious. Put a resistance, put a wall of resistance against your anxiousness. Do not be pulled apart. It will bring disunity in the church. No, do not focus on those things. And he gives the antidote, which I will go on point to. But he's concerned. He's concerned that because they're going through the same problems that he's going through, he's concerned that, you know what? This baby Christians here, this Christians here who are not ready, who are just got born again, they might be pulled apart by these problems. They're experiencing the same problems I'm experiencing. Let me help them out. Let me give them a secret. This is Paul's heart. This is Paul's attitude. And so he writes this letter to them to show them this is what you got to do. This is what you got to do. Now, isn't that so true? Isn't that word so precise to be pulled apart when we're anxious? When you're dealing with problems that you can't fix? Where you can't find a solution? Aren't you more irritable? You can't take even the preaching. You hear a sermon, you want to get out. I want to take care of my business. I have a bigger problem than this. Hearing a man preach. Don't you get more irritable with people? Aren't you less gentle? I preach and rejoicing. No, how hard, you know how hard it is to be rejoicing when you have problems? You know how hard it is to be gentle when you have problems? And it's interesting that Paul very wisely puts this command after he tells them, rejoice and be gentle. With all the persecution that's going on, Paul, with the enemies of the cross of Christ, with the Judaizers, you in prison, you're telling me? To be gentle, to rejoice, and now not to be anxious? Who do you think you are? You're not in my shoes. But he tells them, yeah, I'm, I'm in your shoes. And I'm about, I'm about to be executed. Think about that. Are you going to be executed? Are you about to be executed? Look at me. So he writes them this letter to show them, look, rejoice. Rejoice with me. I'm about to be Executed and I'm rejoicing. I want you to be executed. I want you to be rejoicing with me. Now, is that you? Is that your attitude, your heart? None of you are being persecuted to death like Paul was. I don't, I, you have difficult impossibilities, absolutely. But so, was, so did Paul. And so, so did the church at Philippi. None of you are being persecuted to the degree that the church of Philippi was being persecuted for their faith. You have freedom of speech. You have freedom of religion. You can preach the gospel. You're not going to be killed for that. Not now. Paul in the church of Philippi, yes. 
Yes. And he tells them, he commands them to rejoice, to be gentle. And now he commands them not to be anxious. Paul is giving the church at Philippi the secret of how to overcome our anxieties, our worries. But now, before I move forward, I want to make it clear that there's a difference between being anxious and having a genuine concern for the problems we face. Yes, for Paul is not saying that it is wrong or it is a sin to be concerned, to have a, a healthy concern about our problems and needs. Or to be concerned about someone else's problems. No, not at all. But the problem lies, and Paul is making that very clear, the problem lies in how we handle them, in what our priorities are, and the focus of our hearts and minds when we deal with, with pressing issues. That's what Paul is talking about. Indeed, we see this point illustrated throughout his letter. Remember that just a couple of chapters before, Paul complimented young Timothy for being genuinely concerned for the welfare of the Philippians. Yes, he told them, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. That same Greek word there, concern, is the same Greek word here for anxiousness. Look it up in the strong. Same Greek word. So what's the difference? For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests. Not those of Jesus Christ. And then we see a few verses earlier. We read that Paul said to the Philippians. To let each of you look not only to his own interests. Not only to his own concerns but also to the interests of others. So again, Paul is here in agreement that we should have a healthy concern for each other and we should have a healthy concern for our own needs. Philippians 2, 4. So it is not wrong to be concerned, but again, the difference lies in how we handle our issues, how are we handling our problems, in what our priorities are, and the focus of our hearts and minds. And so what should they be like? What should, they, what should our attitude be when we're going through problems and issues in our life? Well, our hearts and minds should be free from anxiety. That is the command. Free from anxiety. Free from worry. Free from being overly concerned. And... This means, and what Paul is talking here about, is about experiencing a paralyzing concern. Basically having a concern that paralyzes you from being effective in the kingdom of God. All of us have problems. And your problems ain't bigger than no one else's. Everybody has problems at different degrees. But it's, it, regardless of, of, of how big it is, your your heart, your mind should still be focused on the kingdom. It should be a concern that does not take away from you the peace of God. There should be peace of God in your heart and, and life. That's what he's talking about. Because when you let your anxiety take over, and you lose the peace of God. And you lose trust that God is still in control even though you're going through very difficult times. That's sin. That's why it's a strong command. It's, it's sin when you let your problems take control. Take charge. And controls your priorities. Your priorities switch to now taking care of yourself and your problems instead of focusing still on the kingdom of God. That is what Paul is concerned about. That's what is Paul letting them know. Like, look, rejoice, be gentle, and now don't be anxious. 
He knows what they're going through. Epaphroditus already told him everything. This letter is written because Paul talked to Epaphroditus. He knew what was going on. And so he wrote them a letter about those pressing concerns that the church at Philippi were going through. But he wants to encourage them. He wants to help them now. He wants to tell them and give them the secret. Here's the secret, church, of how to handle your problems. Here's the antidote. But be first, start by putting a wall of resistance against your anxieties. Yes, it's a wall of resistance that we need to put up. What is resistance? It means to stand on your ground. It means to stand on, on your ground. It is defensive. Stand on your ground. Stay, stand on the truth. And stand there. On, 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 the, on the promises of God. Stand still there. Don't let the devil. Don't let whatever's happening around you. Stand still on the promises of God. Put a wall of resistance. That's what Paul is talking about here. And we see, and we see that. Very clearly through all the whole scriptures. Not just in Philippians. We can go through all the, 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 the text. But I'm not going to go through that. We'll be here all day. All night. So I'm not going to do that. But I'm just giving you the highlight. Put a wall of resistance. Do not be anxious. Now. About what? What we shouldn't be anxious about. About anything. He makes it clear about anything and anything that might be worrying you right now at the moment. Put a wall of resistance against that that is worrying you right now in your mind or in your heart. A pressing issue you have right now. Think about it. I want this sermon to be practical, to be useful to you. Whatever is bothering you right now, put a wall of resistance to it. Don't let it bother you anymore. Right now it ends. You ain't going any farther. Now, we have many worries. But it's interesting how Jesus highlights and brings some major issues that the church, that the, the disciples were dealing with. I know there's more than just the ones I will highlight. But Jesus dealt with his disciples about this issue of anxiety. He knew what they were going through. He wanted them to be free from anxiety. And so he tells his disciples in Matthew 6.25... 32 and 33, he tells them, therefore I tell you, he's speaking to his disciples, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Yes, all these things will be added to you. Now, in this passage, we read that Jesus first commands his disciples not to be anxious. Not to be anxious about what? About life in general. But also about the necessities of life, such as food, drink, and clothing. Now, I know that many of us here do not worry about these things in America. I know that. But that's not a compliment. For we worry about things that we shouldn't even worry about. Don't take this as a compliment. It's not a compliment. This is the things that they worry in the first century church. This is what the disciples worry about. And at least they worry about things that were important, that were necessary in nature. But we worry about the next gadget. We worry about the, the most expensive car or having a... We, we worry about things that we shouldn't even worry about. But Jesus mentions things that we should be worried about if we don't have them to some degree, but we shouldn't worry. That makes us... That should bring some conviction in us because even I myself, all of us worry about things that we shouldn't. Women like to have beautiful nails and you should. I'm not discouraging that. Man should dress nice. And I'm not saying anything against that. But we do worry about things that they're not the necessities of life. Let's just be honest. And so if Paul, and no, Paul, if Jesus told his disciples not to worry about the necessities of life, the most important things, how much more we shouldn't worry about things that 
really don't even matter. Do not really make a difference in our lives. Do not have an impact on Christians or helping other people. We shouldn't worry about that. And I'm not against being rich. I'm not, if God gives you the, the means to be rich and fine, invest it in the kingdom. Invest it in the kingdom. And so I don't want you to take that. But it's very interesting that Jesus doesn't tell us and doesn't tell his disciples not to, not, he's not telling them in our text that these things are unimportant. And I want you to see that. He tells them in our text that your heavenly father knows that you need them all. So what is that saying? He's telling his disciples, let us not be worried about the necessities of life, the important things of life. But then he tells them, your father knows that you need them. So what is he doing? He's, he's, he's telling them that, look, even before you, you, you need these things, God knows that you need them. And so trust him. Seek the kingdom first and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So he's saying, put the kingdom first. Focus on the kingdom Take care of souls. Take care of your soul. Focus on worshiping him. In church and outside of church throughout your life. Spend your life in the kingdom. Building the kingdom of God. And don't worry about the rest. God already knows that you need them. And so what can we learn from Christ? Well, that God is our provider. This is what this text is telling us. That God is our provider. And that he knows our needs even before we ask him. And so this truth should challenge us, brothers and sisters, to prioritize our relationship with God above all else in the midst of the storm, in the midst of your necessities, in, in the midst of your wants. Put Christ first. This is the lesson here. This is what Jesus is telling his disciples, and we should take that in. This is the same thing Paul is telling the church of Philippi. Do not be anxious about everything. About anything. Don't. And so, with this, I'm going to my second point. It says, Paul told the church at Philippi, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by and anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So, point two. Second, let us pray to God with gratitude for all our needs and wants. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So, in a nutshell, the antidote for winning the victory over our anxieties, says Paul, is the right kind of prayer. The right kind of prayer. But in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. That's the right kind of prayer. In everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's the right kind of prayer. With thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Yes. Paul calls the church at Philippi to go vertical. We put a wall of resistance by going vertical. You have a problem right now? Resist. Go vertical. Now prayer is the general word for making requests known to God. It's the general. It carries the idea of adoration, devotion, and worship. Yes, this is the antidote. If you're dealing with anxiety like I do, probably am sure you do, this is the antidote here. This is the medicine. This is what you need. Prayer. And prayer carries the idea of adoration, devotion, and worship. Yes, in Psalm 95.6, the psalmist pray. Listen to this. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. What is that called? It's called adoration. 
He begins with adoration. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And so, whenever we find ourselves filled with anxiety, our first, first action ought to be to spend time alone with God in prayerful adoration and worship. This is the antidote. Why? Because the adoration for God will help us to remember His greatness and majesty. Which will help us in filling our hearts and minds with faith and hope. As we face the challenges and problems that are too big for us to resolve on our own. Adoration. Yes, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. Psalm 145.3. Now do you think that this, this psalmist didn't go through problems? Do you think they're just it's poetry to them? No, they're teaching us how to pray. They're teaching us how to approach God when you have anxiousness. David, when he approached God in the Psalms, when you read his prayers, adoration, because he had so much anxiety. The man is giving us the antidote for our anxieties. Let's start with adoration. Now, too often we rush into God's presence and rapidly tell Him our needs. And all of us do that, especially when we are in a rush. We think that we gain more by just rushing our prayers. And all of us do that. We think that we gain more by just going through this prayer problem that we have. Just, just ask Him. Just start by asking Him right away. Without meditating first. And who our God is. And that's really sad. Because freedom from anxiety comes when we spend more time on who our God is than on our circumstances and how big our problems are. Yes, when you start looking at this majestic, this great God that we have, that we're coming before us, that we're coming under, it, it makes our problems look so small. And then we can ask with reverence. Then we can ask with humility. But if we rush into this prayer with all our worries and concerns, we think we almost pray just manipulating God. Just we pray undermining, just not really with faith, believing that He can actually do it. Almost demanding. Or telling him, this is what you got to do and this is how you got to do it. We have to be careful with that. No, we have, when we are dealing with a lot of anxiety, we need to start with adoration. Knowing, coming into contact with the living God. And who is this God? The creator of heaven and of earth. All our problems, guess what, are small. Are really small to him. But we don't see them like that. We see our problems so big. The devil makes us feel like our problems are so great and big that he can't resolve them. But no, our, all our problems are small to God. There's no big problems. They're only big problems to us, but not, problem, not a big problem to God. God can fix anything. That's why the psalm is praying in adoration. Listen to this, Psalm 86, 10, and 11. For you are a great... And do wondrous things. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. That I may walk, with, that I may walk without anxiety, regardless of my problems, regardless of my circumstances, and regardless of how I feel. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, we look at the general call to prayer, but now at the call, let us look at the call to supplication with thanksgiving. Now, in our call to supplication is where we begin making our requests known to God, our petitions. Yes, and it involves a, pet a petition, a supplication, is an earnest Sharing of our problems and needs. It's a specific, a supplication 
focuses on the problem itself. It, 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 it's directed to God. It's in a specific prayer. And it's important that we learn to pray like this. For again, freedom from anxiety does not come from half, half-hearted prayers or non-specific prayer. For Jesus said, this is what Jesus said, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The lost world. The world that doesn't know Christ. As the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. This is mechanical. This is a prayer that is rushed. That does not acknowledge in the heart of the prayer. The person who's praying does not acknowledge the majesty. The greatness of God. No, sometimes we have to slow down and, and, and think and meditate on who is this God that we're coming under. We're coming under a God that is great, that created the heavens and the world, all of the universe in words, in just a few words. Let there be light and there was light. Let there be uh, darkness, there was darkness. There was, let there be uh, an earth and there was an earth. Just like that, we have to humble ourselves before our Almighty God. And that will lead to our healing. And that will lead to help us overcome our anxieties, our worries. Which in God's sight is, they're nothing. And we know that some people say, well, does God hear the prayer of the lost? He hears them. When he says he won't hear them, he means he won't answer them. He means they're insincere. They're trying to get something out of God, but they're not interested in worshiping him. That's what he's saying. They're not interested in worshiping God. They're interested in getting something out of God, but they're not interested in worshiping him. So God will not hear that prayer. And God has to write. Why should he hear your prayer when you treat him like he's nothing? He gave you life, he gave you bread, but you treat him like he's nothing. God will not hear that prayer. What that means is, yes, he does know that you're praying. He knows what you're saying. But he's not going to answer that because your heart attitude is wrong. Because you're treating him like he's nothing. Like he needs to answer. You're demanding from him. You think like he has to answer you. Like you deserve something when you don't deserve really anything. So he needs to humble you. He needs to humble you. And so God will not hear them. That's why we need to pray sincerely with all our hearts. Like Jesus did to save us. Yes, Jesus set the example. And we see that in the author of the book of Hebrews. He said to him, in the days of his, pla- and of his flesh, that was Jesus when he was on earth. Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. That's Jesus praying with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was hurt because of his reverence. So Jesus was hurt because of his reverence. To who? To God. To God his Father. And being made perfect... He became the source of eternal salvation. Yes, brothers and sisters, Jesus is our example, our role model, and how should we learn to pray? How to pray sincerely with reverence and with a humble spirit. Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was hurt because of his reverence. Yes, He prayed like this to save us when he was at the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, God, please remove this cup from me. Remove this cup from me. He didn't want to die. And he wanted to go to the cross. He wanted to die for us. Yes. But also like Paul commanded the Philippians. That's how, what he commanded the Philippians to do, to pray with prayers and supplications, with thanksgiving. He prayed, he told the church at Philippi to pray in the same way that Jesus prayed for our salvation. 
but also like Peter commanded the Christians in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. This is what he told them. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Casting all your anxieties on him. Casting all your anxieties is another way of praying, of supplication. When you cast your anxieties to him, you have so much going on with you, you can't handle it. You acknowledge your insufficiency. You acknowledge your inability to do anything to fix your problems, and so you cast them to God. You throw them to God. You, you can't fix it. Humility. Humility. First Peter 5, 6, and 7. But now is that you? Do you pray like this when you're dealing with anxiousness? Or you go, look, I'm going to just go fix my problems. I have Christians that have told me, Christians that have told me, brother, I just feel when I pray that I'm wasting time. I feel like I need to just get to work, get it done, go to the social security office, do this, do that. I just feel like when I start praying, when I'm, when I'm anxious, I just cannot pray. I'll, I just put it off for another time when I'm calm. No, that's when you should pray. That's the opposite. That's what God is calling you to. You need to put a resistance to whatever you're going through. Put a stop to it. Let everything else be on hold. And pray. And pray to God. That's the time to pray. It's not before. It's not when everything is fixed. No. The time to, to pray is the time when you feel the most anxious. Then you put a wall to resistance and you say, no, I'm coming to God with this prayer. I'm going to cast my anxieties to him. That shows humility. That shows that dependence on God. And that's what we all need. And that will lead to your healing. That will lead to being completely protected and guarded by God, as we will see next. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Here it is. Now Paul ends his command by telling the Philippians that praying, as he commanded them, will result in a fortress guarding their hearts and minds. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. That means it's supernatural. That means when he says it surpasses all understanding, he's talking about human understanding. He's saying, look, no psychology will be able to figure this one out. This peace that comes from God surpasses all understanding. You can't figure it out. But you will have peace in the midst of a storm. That's what Paul is saying here. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding all human understanding will guard. That's a fortress there. That word guard means it will be like a fortress guarding your hearts and minds from anxiety, from pressure, from going crazy, becoming all, when you're all anxious, you're, you, you, you're, you, you're irritable. Nobody can talk to you. You're like, I don't want to talk to anybody. Guard your hearts and minds. That's what we will happen when you put God, when you trust in God, when you pray. You will be, you will, it will be like a guard, a supernatural guard protecting your heart and mind. And you will be the most gentle person even in the midst of the storm. That's the difference. Supernatural. Yes, Christ promises, God promises a peace which surpasses all understanding. And it is a peace that the world cannot provide. But he can. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, this is what he said to John, in John 14, 27, Peace I live with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Let your hearts not be troubled. Not be irritable. Not be pulled apart by in different directions. Neither let them be afraid. Again, this peace that God gives you is supernatural. 
The world can't give you. It is not psychology. It is not a pill that will make you feel better or disconnected from your problems. And it's not a self-help book either. This peace comes from God. It's from above. It comes from God. And it surpasses anything that human beings can ever explain about it. Nobody, no psychologist will be able to figure that one out. How does that person have peace? I don't know. You take this pill, that's what they will tell you. But no, that Christian has peace because it comes from God. It can't be comprehended by the human mind. And even the greatest minds will not be able to comprehend that supernatural peace which comes from God. Because God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And his ways are higher than our ways. Man can't comprehend it. But I've seen people in very, very impossible situations that have this peace. Like that young man that I spoke in jail, in prison. He's going to be there maybe 25 years. I don't know how long. Maybe more. He has peace in that prison. How? Look at all the crimes he committed. What a bad boy. He's 33 years old. His whole life is going to be in prison. He has peace. Man can't comprehend it. You can't comprehend it. I cannot comprehend it. How? God gives you that peace. It's supernatural. And so this peace from God will guard our hearts from being pulled apart in different directions by the storms of life. Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace in Christ. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. Be courageous. I have overcome the world. This is what he told his disciples. I have said these things to you that in, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. Be courageous. I have overcome the world. Now, Jesus made it very clear that in this world, your circumstances will not change. In the world, you will have tribulation. And that has been my own plight. That's has been my own life. I had a knee brace. I hurt myself. I had a knee brace a year ago. I twisted my ankle. Now I have carpal tunnel. I have... You know, and a lot more other things that you don't know. Panic disorder, anxiety disorder, blood sugar high, blah, blah, blah. How could I be preaching here and still smile at you? Simple as that. Think about that. It's supernatural. Mr. Griffith had cancer. Other men had other issues. All, every man can give you their, 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 their walk with Christ, their... It hasn't. In the world, you will have tribulation. Settle it. Ain't gonna get better. In this fallen world, you will have tribulation. Jesus said it. What's the difference? But take heart. Be courageous. I have overcome the world. It is a peace that comes from God. It's a peace that comes from the fact that Jesus died for your soul, pay for your sins. You're standing righteous with God. It doesn't matter what the world does to you. It won't matter a thing because you have a supernatural peace from God that will keep you in perfect peace. And those who keep their minds on him, he will guard your minds and hearts. He will protect you like a fortress so that you're not any longer in fear, afraid. It will take your fear away. It will bring you peace, supernatural peace. And you will be able to smile at the world as the world is in a storm. As the problems of life come to you. In whatever angle, in whatever direction, you will be able to look to Christ and say, it's okay. I can endure anything because you are with me. Because you give me your grace. In the Lord, you will be able to do anything. Go through the ups and downs. It's not a change of circumstances. It's a peace that rests in your hearts and minds and soul. It's something supernatural. You can undergo anything. Jesus said it. In this world, you will suffer tribulation. You will have tribulation. It won't change. But be courageous. In me, be courageous. 
I have overcome the world. He already overcame the world when he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And if you're lost, he overcame the world to pay for your sins. He has did, done it all. And so in conclusion, I know you don't have this peace. If you're lost, I know you don't have this peace. But if you want this peace, Jesus has overcome the world so that you might have this peace. But you need to surrender to Christ. You need to give your life to Christ. Because or, or otherwise you won't have the peace that I've been preaching about. If you're not a Christian, if you don't know Jesus, you're not going to have this peace. You need this peace. If you want peace, you need Jesus. You need Jesus so that you can be free from anxiety. The world will not give you this peace. Only Jesus can give you that peace. And so, pray. Ask God. Talk to me. Talk to Pastor Chan tonight. Or, and, and, and let us talk about how we can help you find Jesus so that you can have now this peace which surpasses all understanding that Christians can also have and enjoy in, if, if they have if they put their minds, if they put their focus on Christ and, 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 and put a wall in re of resistance and don't focus on the world and the things of the world, what's happening in their lives. No. Just settle it with your minds. It won't change a thing. You, the, the, in the world, you will have tribulation. But in Christ, you will have peace. Pray. Paul told us what to do. He, that he gave us the antidote. Pray. Just pray. Start with adoration. Give him the glory. Put him first. Seek the kingdom first and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Everything that you need will be given to you by God. It is a promise. But don't look at yourself, at your, at your problems. Don't focus on that. Be concerned. Have a healthy concern for you and for others. Yes. Let that overwhelm you. No. Put a wall of resistance. Rejoice. Be gentle. And do not be anxious. That's my message for you this evening. In Jesus' name. Man. All right. Man. Let us stand, and I'll, be, I'll pray. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this message. We thank you, God, that you have given us your Son, and that in your Son we can have peace, a peace which surpasses all understanding through Christ Jesus, God. So, God, thank you for Jesus, for his wonderful peace that he has given us, Thank you for Christ and his blood which recon have reconciled us to your God, to God who is a holy God and we have sinned against, but yet we can have peace because of your son. Help us to learn how to pray with adoration and thanksgiving, with humility, God, like Jesus prayed. And teach us, God, to learn how to overcome our anxieties through prayer, God. Whatever we're going through, whatever is in our minds, whatever is occupying your, your, our hearts that is not, that is not uh, from Christ, I pray that you will remove that, that we will put a wall of resistance against this anxiety, against this sin or whatever it is that's troubling us. Put a, help us to put a wall and help us to cast our anxieties to thee, God. Help us to cast them unto thee so that we can be free from anxiety. And we can have a healthy concern for the people and for our problems and lives, but not be overwhelming where we are paralyzed from serving thee, God. Please send thy spirit and help us in this way. Please bless the food that we're about to eat, that we will eat as we go to the different places. Bless everything that we do tonight. Bless our fellowship, our time uh, with each other. In Jesus' name, amen.